Social Media University. Jack, what is going on, my man? How you doing? I'm doing well. New York City living. Yeah. Friday, no complaints. Yeah. We were just talking about that. So you're back in New York now. Uh, first of all, we talked a bit about it, but I'd love for you to tell everyone else, what's life like in New York right now as we're getting later into COVID? New York is getting better, which is great to see. Honestly, the Knicks, I think, are helping. Yes. Um, <laughs> and eight, eight wins in a row, and the city's ready to explode, and it feels like everyone wants the city to explode and be back to, you know, the greatest city in the world. So it's getting better. It's improving. The weather's helping. Everything's trending in the right direction. That's the important thing is that the hope is still there, and I'm actually a Knicks fan myself, so this, this season's been – been pretty crazy to see. I, I was I didn't expect this kind of result so far, but uh, hey, I'll take it. That's awesome to see. So, I've been following you on Instagram for a while, but this is the first time that we've actually had the opportunity to speak. So, I've always been curious about what you do because I'm a huge sports fan. But you get to live, breathe, and work in sports every single day. So, I'd love to hear more about your story and how you got to that point. So, like, where did you grow up? Obviously, you were involved in sports, but how did you get involved in sports in the capacity that you are today? Yes. Yeah, so the origin story to it all is actually I grew up in a family business of beer distribution and we're lucky enough to sell beer to the Ravens and the Orioles. So when I was growing up, my mom was the biggest sports fan in the family because she who's now president of the family business, um, you know, if the Ravens win and they win in the playoffs, that means another week of beer sales. So I really grew up in the business of sports and watching her be a maniac, caring about you know the wins for the bottom line. So I think I always had that ingrained in me. Then grew up in Maryland, uh, you know, a fun sports town, and you know we just kind of always had entrepreneurship around around me, um, stringing lacrosse sticks, selling brownies at school, whatever I could kind of do. And then when I got to school, I went down to UT Austin because I was a huge Vince Young fan. So yep. sports through and through. They had a sport management program. I knew I wanted to study that, work in it. Because um, I always tell people, like, there's a major difference between being a diehard sports fan and wanting to work in sports. Very separate. Um, you need to want to love the business side of it. So got down there, started my own business with my roommate, selling phone cases with designs of sports players, worked with John Wall and, you know, a bunch of guys, and then realized I didn't really love the merch side of it. So switched to creating the ad platform side of it, which was Snapback Sports, built it up, followed, you know, Omar from House of Highlights and what they were doing and kind of molded it on a platform that they weren't doing, you know, sports content on, which was Snapchat. And then just the, the key to it all was engaging the followers and the fans, the community. I call them the Snapback fam because they're family, uh, because I know I, I'd be nothing without them. And I've just been appreciative of them the whole way through. So when did you start building Snapback Sports? I started, so funny enough, like I said, I grew up in sports, uh, sports business, and I named the page my senior year of high school, or sorry, of college, which would have been 2018 in the fall, real underscore sports, because my goal was not only to post like entertaining sports content, highlights, memes, sports culture, but to go to games. I was at UT, so we had big football, basketball, three hours from Houston, Dallas, San Antonio, was home for uh, Ravens, Orioles games, was visiting my girlfriend in New York for Knicks games. So I just had a lot of access, and I was like, Snap's the perfect platform, and this was before Instagram stories, right? This vertical, through the lens type of experience. And another major thing was, you know, I was kind of spoiled growing up in that, you know, I've been to a bunch of sports games, and I definitely took it for granted. 90, 80, 70 percent of my audience has never been to a game. So when I was showcasing these experiences, it was something new for them from, you know, the hot dog I'm eating to where the stadium is in, in relation to the city. So I think they really appreciate it all of that. So yeah, it started um, as real underscore sports because I wanted to showcase real live sports. Well, there's a show called on HBO called Real Sports. So that was a major, uh, you know, major copyright thing. So we shifted to Snapback about two, two and a half years ago. Yeah, yes, that's if, if no one's been to like a sporting environment, they don't get all the stuff that you're talking about. But it, like, it is such an experience and that's why people fall in love with it because there's just there's so much that goes into it and it's pretty difficult to to emulate that in any other way but i get totally what you mean i think snapchat would be the perfect medium for that because it's so immersive and 
almost like POV kind of thing where it's like literally like literally. you're living through yeah. it. So, yeah. like, so when you came to this, obviously you had that vision in mind. Did you see like Snapchat was the obvious place for this or why did you decide on Snapchat? Because Instagram and Twitter, there was just so much going on. There were, you know, six Instagram basketball pages with a million followers. There were 12 Twitter pages that were hidden tweet deck and 250K. And to grow on those platforms is very difficult with that level of competition. I go to Snap and there were some comedy pages that were very big and there were some different types of content. But everyone was like, no one does sports here. It doesn't work. It doesn't hit. Mm. So I was paying, you know, a higher CPM essentially. I would pay for shout outs, right, to grow. And they were like, if you pay, let's say a hundred bucks, normally you'd add a hundred followers or a thousand followers on a comedy page, sports you're gonna add 50. And I was like, that's okay, I want a sports following. So mm. understanding that, um, and then I would pay for a shout out, then I would go pitch some t-shirt company like I had had a few years prior, say, hey, you wanna advertise for a hundred bucks, take the hundred flip it back into a shout out and just snowball it from there. Yeah, man, that, that, that's, that's fascinating to me because I'm very well versed in the world of Instagram and YouTube, but Snapchat, like I know yeah. nothing. Like, I didn't even know that that was something that you could do with buy shout outs over there. So is it still possible to grow on Snapchat today in 2021? Impossible. So that's, that's the next question that I always get, which is like, could you still pull it off? So yeah. they changed the algorithm. So like I said, I was buying these shout outs, which were converting. And when social media platforms are new, people are more right. Like think about yeah. how easy it was to throw a TikTok follow. Now For people sure. are, you know, a little more <laughs> yeah. particular with their TikTok follow. So I was just in a good timing with like people were willing to follow. Then when I say it snowballed, the way Snap was set up was anyone could end up on the Explore page. So I knew if I paid and got enough shout outs to get to hit a certain user base, whatever it was, 100,000 followers, that I would end up on Explore. And then it was that organic traffic, pretty much like ending up on For You or Explore on uh, Instagram. That now is limited to their exclusive content, which is their shows, or if you have a Snap Star. So, I, you know, SnapX doesn't have a Snap Star. So, it kind of, and it's very hard to grow. The only way you can really grow would be uh, from users sharing their content, like in their group with other users. Um, so, yeah, I would not suggest going <laughs> and trying to, to, to trying to do that unless you come from a different, um, like you have a, a user based on a different platform you can send and you obviously have to fit the demo right like snap mm. tends to be a younger audience so just you know the normal things in social yeah so you when you were doing this you found a blue ocean in snapchat and then you went yeah. hard in it so you just said today that that's that's no longer the case with snapchat what platform do you think is the closest to that kind of opportunity today yeah, so I always talk about organic. The only two platforms I think you can grow organically right now, top of mind, is TikTok and YouTube. Um, TikTok, obviously, for you page, you make good content. It, they're really good at surfacing it. Monetizing on that platform, that's a whole different story, right? You see yes. people pushing towards other platforms, which is similar to what I did on Snap from the start. Monetizing on Snap was really hard. We've kind of unlocked that. But, you know, for a few years, it was like, I have to do this on Twitter or Instagram or other places. Um, and then YouTube. Um, but it takes, you know, high level production, a ton of work. You really got to grind. You got to be awesome on camera. You, you know, you got to do all these things. That's for anything. But, uh, yeah, YouTube, where you can, anywhere you can pick, get organic pickup really is where I've seen success for people. Mm -hmm. So what do you think? I'm curious yeah. from your point of view. <laughs> yeah, absolutely. I appreciate you throwing that back at me. So I would echo largely what you said. I think TikTok and YouTube in terms of organic reach, I still think that Instagram is 100% possible. Okay. You just have to stand out more than you've ever had to in the past. Uh, and like, there's still pages that blow up very quickly on Instagram, but they are that 1%. So right. I think the majority of people aren't willing to do that or put in the effort to be that. So they all just assume that Instagram's dead. If a platform becomes dead, and they'll die with it over time. Like not, that's never gonna be completely the case, but it is way harder than it's ever been because it's so easy to create Instagram content, which I think is the, the blessing and the curse is that everyone's posting right. out the same crap. So then people are just, they're numb to it. So uh, I, think, I think you're spot on YouTube and uh, TikTok, but you're right too. I love that you mentioned this. It's, it's easy to build an audience on TikTok. It's, it's so difficult to monetize it and even get them right. to other places. TikTok is the beast that it is because they keep you on there. Mm -hmm. 
Yeah, exactly. So, and and I think you know I see a lot of similarities between early days Snap, which is like there was no brands that wanted to advertise with me on Snapchat until I could really show what I was doing. And because TikTok is so algorithm focused, whereas with my content, it's less that way. Like I can post a selfie video talking about, you know, RJ Barrett's dunk and I'll get the same amount of views because that's just how Snap stories work. Like people click through them. Whereas TikTok, you post any type of ad based content and the algorithm just slashes it, you know? Yeah, no, that's crazy. So you just mentioned a bit about how Snapchat's a little bit of a different beast, but I'm curious about the business model of everything that you do like how what is like what how do you guys run as a business like what do you like how do you guys like what what is the business of it because obviously you have a massive audience and and you're there but like what is the day-to-day running the business of that yeah so it's kind of evolved over the past few years which was like we would take these you know i don't want to talk crap on them but these shitty t-shirts and try and sell them right for this brand and we just got paid on a cpm basis to now we're in brand partnerships so similar like an instagram influencer pretty much but we're now booking year-long deals because i don't want to you know advertise for puma on tuesday and nike on friday and reebok next monday because i think it's like it takes away any influence you have because influence is really just confidence so if you're talking about this shoe today and then that shoe tomorrow, it doesn't really make sense unless you are a shoe reviewer like Jacques on Snapchat, he does a great job. Um, So we're working with some gaming company, Underdog Fantasy, um, driving new kind of sports gaming fans, fantasy fans. We're working with the ticketing company because we want to work with true integrations to where it doesn't feel like it's a billboard ad. I go to the game, I use TickPick, and that's our sponsor, right? I'm already mm-hmm. using them, and now I'm just bringing awareness to them. I have a code, and then we want to integrate even more to just just higher levels. So, uh, yeah, we're we're just really brand integration strong with a bunch of different companies to where you don't want to feel it in the content. Um, it just kind of goes alongside it. Yeah, yeah. I just grabbed my phone here because I, I thought that. I want to double check the title because I didn't want to get it wrong. You're the head of winning at Underdog Fantasy. Can you, can you speak to what that means? Yeah, so, you know, all these companies, uh, like you see Josh Richards, right? He takes, like, these strategy directors at Triller or, you know, they, Kanye is, like, I don't know what his title is at Adidas. He obviously doesn't work there, but, mm. like, they want him to have a role there and and fully, fully integrate in. So we wanted to kind of accomplish the same thing. We thought the head of winning was like a funny thing um, because, you know, I want my people to win at playing at underdog. So that's the title we gave. And then I can give feedback on, you know, the app and I can communicate what my audience is seeing to them and and really just help underdog grow as a whole. Uh, But yeah, the title was pretty funny. Yeah, that's awesome. That makes the whole thing fun, right? I think that's the whole point is that makes it very approachable. So like you're, you're my age, you were both 96s. So like you built this whole juggernaut that like businesses try to build this kind of stuff all the time, but it always seems like it's people like yourself who build these massive audiences on things because you're immersed in it, you get it. So how did you go from building this massive audience to then now like building these partnerships with brands? Like what was that evolution like from just audience to business, if that makes sense? Yeah, yeah. And and like I touched on, I think I had a little background in it. And the thing is, you have to, that's another whole thing with these influencers of these big pagers is like, I've always said is I actually get the business side of it. So I know what the brand or the business is looking for, whether it's a depositor, whether it's a purchaser, whether it's a viewer, whatever it is. Um, but I also brought on a business manager who's really good um, at setting up these deals, communicating, kind of being the liaison between them. Uh, it, it's outreach because you, the discovery, like I mentioned on Snap is is none. And so we're going out to brands and saying, hey, Puma, like we have 150,000 people who are gonna watch this story today and they're all in your target demo. They could be Puma yeah. fans for life. And we talk about basketball all the time, you know, and they're like, okay, we'll send you a pair of shoes, which is a great start. But eventually you gotta make money on this stuff, right? And everyone grows up and they wanna get the gear but then when you get to you know my age and you got to pay rent, then you need more than just the free pair of shoes. So you know, just figuring out how do you provide extra value for them, whether it's social awareness, whether it's their product launch, um, a, a million different things. But yeah, we had to make a hard transition into monetizing the platform. One hundred percent, and that's uh, 
it's it's funny because like I started, I started off in YouTube and I like I remember I got the, my first like product sent to me and I thought I was like I made it bro like I didn't I didn't have yeah. to pay for this like but then you quickly realize that once you start doing this full time you're like okay well this is now a business and it has to be treated as such right so do you think that there's more value in the fact that you're basically the only player or the biggest player in the Snapchat space like would you rather be where you are right now in Snapchat or would you rather have that same size audience on say like Instagram because I assume that there's hmm. more value being the only player in Snapchat. That's a good question. I think there's there's way more value in being the only player if Snapchat kind of gets picked up as like a, a platform for businesses to advertise, right? Like right now, YouTube, Instagram, they're just the kings. That's where people get it. I still remember the trend, which was like, oh, influencer marketing stupid to finally these, right, these big brands got Instagram marketing, right? And they understood the value in it. I still don't think we're there yet with Snap. That's also in part because Snap just wasn't pushing that. When I talked to Snap over the past three years, they're like, we're a one-to-one platform. We want just friends on the app. We don't need influencers. We don't need creators. And then I think they saw TikTok to a degree and they were like, okay, maybe we should be more conscious of like this type of thing. And and they've made massive strides already in the past year. So I think we're, I actually love the position I'm in today because I think Snap's investing in the platform when it comes to kind of business influencer creator types. Three years ago, two years ago, probably would have leaned Instagram, but um, big fish in a small pond, right? Versus, you know, smaller fish in a big pond. It's very interesting. I personally just like the platform of Snap. So that's, you know, I think that's different and not really ever going to be talked about as much because like you said, like we're really the only ones doing it at a, at a high level. Yeah, and I guess from that point, like you, you dictate the conversation. So uh, as Snapchat grows and evolves, which they're obviously trying to do, then you benefit from that too because you're already there. You're the, exactly. the obvious choice. So in speaking to the fact that they are trying to invest in their product and making it a, a better experience, so I never jumped on that wave where they were like paying creators a million dollars a day or, or, or whatever. Do, can, are you familiar with that whole thing? Can you explain yeah. what, what they're doing there? Yeah, so Spotlight. So they like I was just talking about, it was really just friend to friend content or you'd have story, which was mostly watched by your friends. There was no fun content that was being created on Snap that you could share and pick up virality, Twitter retweets, TikTok for you page, Instagram explore, et cetera, YouTube obviously too. Um, so they wanted to get more people on the app and to share that content. So they added Spotlight and they were giving away a million dollars a day. And I was really excited about it. I was honestly more excited about it because I thought it was going to be a great opportunity for me to grow. Um, And I'm not, I don't think I fit that content perfectly. So I didn't really like figure out the key and unlock it. A lot of people did. I know there's some kids in LA who made millions and millions of dollars. You know, they went on podcasts and talked about that. But, you know, it just kind of was showing that, okay, here's another thing to keep you on the app. Um, and they're always iterating. I mean, that was a map page, and then it was a show page, and then it was a VOD page, and now it's Spotlight. So I did have I did have one that went viral. I made like three grand on it, paid for my first month rent uh, and security deposit here, but nothing, not, no million dollar story that I wish I could share. <laughs> so do, do, are you a believer in that feature for the platform? Like, do you think it's gonna work? Um, honestly, I don't, I don't know if that's what Snap's gonna, gonna lean on. I think it's a nice added feature. Um, I just don't know if people go to Snap to create that type of content, right? Mm -hmm. Um, whereas, you know, it's built for TikTok and it's built for Instagram Reels and all these other places. It'll be interesting. One of the things I love though, is they're willing to test and to try and to fail. And they could launch this, they could invest $20 million, $50 million into it. And if, you know, it got... You know, if it just got people on the app, I think that's a win overall. Um, but I think where they win long term is they they have an incredible shopping experience, like a second to only Amazon, and no one knows about it. It's as simple as like once your info's in there, it's like two two click, like swipe up on the product, size, color, order straight to your straight to your home, um, and then VR and AR, right? With what they have filters, lenses. I mean, that's where the world's heading. So I don't see anyone else touching them in that department right now. Yeah, and that's so, I wasn't even aware of that. And I work in this space that I guess yeah. they have a near frictionless purchasing experience, which is, yes. you, can't, you can't overstate how valuable that is because any point yeah. of friction is gonna create more of a problem and, and drop off rate. So, and also aren't their ads like substantially more affordable than other platforms? 
their their ad platform is way more affordable it also converts app downloads at an extremely high rate which is who i worked with early days a lot of startup okay. companies that we were just trying to drive app downloads because it just had so much success i think in part to the nature of it which was the swipe ups really easy but also the the younger audience they had less spending power because they were younger mm. But would they download a free app all day, every day, right? So I think that, you know, there's been more spending power on the app now. Like I started this four years ago. All those people are now four years older, which I've sure. definitely seen, which is awesome. Um, so, yeah, I think that there's a ton of, I mean, the swipe up's the most powerful tool on Snapchat. Like I say 10x conversion versus an Instagram story, which is insane to think about, but it, it's untapped. Yeah, I think people are nearly numb to, to Instagram stories at this point. They just get so used to just whipping through them so quickly that yeah. they, they've lost a lot of their power. But so I want sorry, my camera's going crazy there. So I only got like one more Snapchat specific question for yeah. you and then I want to move on to some other stuff. So obviously like your bread and butter is Snapchat, but it's not what it was when it was in its peak. Uh, I think that's like a lot of people would say that. Like I don't yeah. use Snapchat like I used to. I used to be all over that thing. I no longer am. Is if you were driving the ship when it comes to Snapchat, what do you think that they could do to become like to really regain some of that dominance in the social space? It's interesting because they really still have a lot of the core thesis to what they do, right? Which is right. like you want to send your friends messages and you can share in a group. I just think it's a different generation that's really on it, right? Like we slightly outgrew it to a degree. My friends, our usage is definitely down, but it's just as active of a community. Um, and I think it just does a really good job. The, the, honestly, the only thing I would adjust right now, I think they're creating a lot of fun content on the right side of the app, which keeps people on the app. And it can be right like YouTube, but on Snapchat. But their ad platform is like, 10 second snap, 10 second snap, ad, five second unskippable, 10 second snap, 10 second snap, five second unskippable ad, which is actually a pretty poor viewing experience in my opinion. Whereas YouTube, I think you're going to the app obviously knowing you're gonna have to sit through that 15 second or 30 second ad, but it's one time for the most part. And then you unlock six minutes of content and then maybe, you know, depending on the length of the video, that's what I would adjust because I actually do think there's some fun content on there. Yeah. Um, and then they'll just run away with AR and VR opportunities. They need to really get, they, honestly, the thing they need is celebrities back on. They need to make Snap cool again and be the mm -hmm. place you want to post. When Bleacher Report picks up Lamar Jackson's Instagram story, it, it kind of you know verifies Instagram as a source of news, as a place to be. Right. And you see people tweet about platforms and we don't even realize it anymore. But it's like how you report on the news, who storied this, who tagged this, who did this. There's no tagging on Snap really between creators. Like uh, you've got, you know, star athletes following House of Highlights on Instagram, wanting their stuff to be posted there. Star athletes on Snapchat, like if they reached out to me, I would post and tag them. And then they grow massively, but there's no incentive to grow for them because there's no monetization available to them. So it's all just a chain of events that I think they'll they'll figure out sooner or later. Yeah, I, those are all money points right there. I think that was on, on point. But I, I, as you were speaking there, I actually thought about something personal to me. So my little sister is like, she's like seven or eight years younger than me. And her whole friend base, it lives and breathes Snapchat. Like that's yeah. all they do. They, a lot of them don't even have Facebook. Yeah. Like, so I know when I was in college, like we all, we all coordinated through Facebook groups and I was asking her, I'm like, how are you going to do that? She's like, I don't know. I, I guess Snapchat. Cause they, they don't yeah. even use Facebook. So you're spot on. You're actually it's so right that the younger demographic, they still love Snapchat. So if they make some of those changes that you're referring to, yeah. I think that they still do have a long way to, to grow it and do some pretty awesome things. Yeah. It's a fun platform. I'm excited. I think the leadership they have there is second to none. They're just really smart, adventurous people. And their whole brand has always been about fun, right? Like they're mm. out on the, their office is out on the beach and uh, snap spectacles. All advertising they do is, you know, these smiling people. It reminds me a little bit about Apple, right? Like any yeah. Apple ad you see, it's like how fun life is. Uh, so that is kind of synonymous with Snap, whereas I mean, you're on Instagram a bunch, right? Like, 
in the nicest way possible to me it's kind of like a cesspool sometimes <laughs> especially especially in the comment section right like it it, it can definitely get your mood down yeah. um and i think right now snap is just like the fun place to be yeah and there's value in being light fun and, and uh in being an enjoyable place to be because you're right like i think a lot of people stress so much to the point of on being on instagram where it actually impacts the platform negatively for, all across the board because people are concerned about posting and then okay. even people who do post that they have a negative experience. So yeah. I think you're right on there, but on the topic of fun, uh, as I've been following you over the past, I think it's almost been a year now. Uh, I'm always jealous of the th things that you get to do, the people you get to meet, the athletes you get to meet. Can you speak to some of that? Like the experiences that you've had, if you can name off some of the coolest ones and, and what you get to do. Yeah. So the podcast snapback sports pod really, um, you know, people saw a lot of success over COVID cause that's when it started. We had done, uh, one, maybe two in-person interviews. We had really had two guests call in because it just, it was tough to kind of manage that COVID hits. Everyone's sitting at home. Everyone's learning how to use zoom and people want to keep, you know, stay relevant. Athletes want to stay at the forefront because their salaries just got cut for six months and their agents are like, we got to figure it out. Right. Um, so we just started unloading and we went through a crazy run of guests, CJ McCollum. I got to talk to Mark Cuban, like a million different things. Um, but, but the takeaway was like, these are human beings. You know, and I grew up idolizing these players because I thought it was so cool. And then you kind of recognize like they like to play video games, they eat food and then they play a sport for a living. And, you know, they're playing a game with a round ball and it's pretty awesome that they're super talented at it, but they're just human beings. So I think normalizing those guys has been really cool experience for me. Um, and then the coolest stuff that I do is without a doubt getting on the ground and being able to go to the games like I've worked the Super Bowl, you know. Um, and all you want to do as a kid is be able to go to a Super Bowl um, and being able to say I'm there working, it's my job. And um, some games I'll even get paid to go do it is, you know, it's silly in the grand scheme of things. But that's definitely the coolest thing is because I love like you talked about earlier, the crowd, the experience to it all, interacting with strangers and um, sports to me is I always use this analogy. Apple IPOs or releases of the iPhone 18, their board members are not hugging, slapping each other on the ass. You know, it's good job. We made a lot of money. Good job. Grown men crying because they achieved, right? Like even winning a game and you have fans and it's like 82 year old man with the 19 year old daughter of, of her friend. Like it, it just brings out emotions that are untouched in literally every other field. And I think that's so special. And that's why I love being in the crowd. That's what I miss the most during COVID. Yeah, no, I, I feel that, man. That's the emotional aspect of sports is, I think, what makes it so amazing. And, and unlike anything else, like you said, like grown men cry and, and get <laughs> yeah. super emotional over, over a game. But it just speaks to the power and uh, the intimacy of it, really. Like everyone's so connected. And that's, like, that's one of the things I love so much is that you can go through and people don't really, especially now today, people don't really say hi to each other or anything like that. But when you're at a sporting event and you're like a fan of the same team, you're, like, you're all on the same team. And then that, that's like some of the coolest experiences. So that's gotta be awesome. And especially to get paid for that. That's, that's badass. Yeah, so, exactly. <laughs> very jealous of that. That's awesome. Thank you for sharing that. So you're also a, one of the owners of the FC Wild Aces, mm -hmm. right? Yeah. Can you speak yeah. to that, that whole thing? Like that, cause I, I watched a few games of that league and, and everything. Can you speak to, the league, how it got created, and then how you got involved with owning part of a team? Yeah, so the FCF Fan Control Football League, and for everyone listening, it actually means the fans control the football team. So the, the in the inaugural year, which was this season, there were four teams, and before the season, you sign up on the FCF app or online, and you pick your team, and that's your team, meaning you draft the players on Wednesday nights, you call the plays, so it's a 25-second timer, they give you four uh, pass plays, two runs. You actually select the play, like a video game. And then the players, based on the majority voter, required to run that on the field. So this was originated a bunch of years ago by the four co-founders. They bought uh, an arena football team, and they used the tech that they built to kind of call plays. Quarterback won Rookie of the Year. They had an awesome offense. I don't think their defense was great, which we actually saw in the FCF. <laughs> a, lot of, uh, a lot of no defense being played. Um, and then they brought this alive and my um, connection to it was like, 
fam, which is Snapback family, mm-hmm. like all we ever wanted to do was like you know work together and have an impact, and that's what fans want. It's this you know the ca- the coach couches. Um, you know, everyone wants to say, oh, this is stupid. This is so the <laughs> FCF's like, all right, do it. Do it. Yeah, um, yeah. And so one of the people we had actually interviewed pre-COVID was Austin Eckler. And we had sustained a good relationship. He was going to be one of the co-found or co-owners of the Wild Aces. And so when we talked to the FCF, I was like, I want to be on that team. Fits my vibe. And, um, you know, the teams aren't city specific. So I think what's really cool, right, is like, Growing up, if you're from Washington, D.C. or the Virginia area, you're a Washington football fan. Well, their ownership group, you know, is not the greatest in the world. But you're kind of locked in, right, because you were born there or because your dad was there, right? Mm -hmm. So this was like a fresh start. And you could pick what team you supported based on the owners. So if you fit the vibe of a Bob Mennery or a Richard Sherman or a Quavo, right, you could go one place. (laughs) We had a, a much different vibe. Um, And then everything was streamed through Twitch, and they built a football game that isn't trying to really compete with the NFL. It's a completely different experience, seven-on-seven, call the plays, built in, like, this video game arena. Um, And it was so much fun. I went down for a couple games, actually. They, like, treat me like an owner, which I thought was hilarious because everyone wants to own a team growing up. If you're a sports fan, right, like, that's the dream. And they, like, call me a car and put me in a hotel. And I'm like, this, you know, now I made it, right, in this this football league. And then we ended up going on and winning the championship. And uh, I was down in the bubble because they did a bubble for it. And, like, you know, I'm one of the only owners there because of COVID and stuff. And, like, we went on a walk-off touchdown or something. I'm, like, running on the field. Like, I don't know. I'm an owner. Who can stop me? I got kicked off, like, 30 seconds <laughs> later. But but it was great. It was awesome. That's so amazing, man. That's so cool. I'm, well, I'm super jealous to hear that experience because one of my life goals is to actually own the Jacksonville Jaguars. That's, like, the top goal. So that's, that's so really? cool. Really? Like, yeah, man. I'm a huge Jags fan. Been so since, like, I was, like, 10 years old. And, uh, yeah. The dream was to play and then buy them, but I uh, didn't get to play for them. So the next plan is to hopefully one go. day buy them. But uh, yeah, yeah, hopefully, that's... hopefully the team value doesn't skyrocket after uh, a little T Law and Urban Meyer action. <laughs> I know. Hopefully, by the time I could afford them, which probably will be never, but but if that ever comes, hopefully they're back down a little bit deeper so I can pick them right. up on a good price. But uh, right. we'll see. We'll see. <laughs> so like I know that growing up. I wanted to have a career in sports or like I still hope to eventually get some sort of play within sports because how much I love it. And, and you built your own career and business through that. So a lot of people watching this or listening to this, they're probably sports fans as well. What would you say to a kid who's like probably like 14 who wants a career in sports? Like, do you recommend going the route that you did building your own product or trying to like work for a team or internship? Like, what would you say to someone who really wants to work in sports? Yeah, so the biggest misconception is to get into sports, you have to go to Iowa and sell tickets for a double-A baseball team, right? Like, that's the dream they pitch it, right? And then after six years, you can be here, and then you transfer over to the Royals, and then you can get into the front office. And So that's the team route. It's false. Um, If you're talented, you're going to figure out a way to kind of evade that process. Um, And how do you figure out what you're good at and what you're talented at? My biggest advice is always go start something Mm -hmm. because I'll take this podcast, for example. Yeah, if you're listening to this right now, you're listening to two guys talk, right? But you're going to have to figure out how to edit, market, cut for social, video edit those clips for social, customer support, learn the importance of iTunes ratings and reviews, learn how to monetize the podcast. So just in that, right, maybe sell merch on top of it. I could list 10 more things. So just by going and doing one thing, mm-hmm. you're now going to discover how to do 10 to 12 other things. And I think that's just like how you become a jack of all trades. You learn what you're good at. Maybe you're good on camera. Maybe you have a voice for radio. Maybe you're bad at that, but you're awesome vid- uh, video and audio editor. And so just by starting your own thing, if you're 14, and all you can do is fail, that's the, the luckiest right thing you could possibly have. You're probably not going to make a million dollars off the first podcast you start at 14, but you never know what that's going to lead to. So I always, that's my biggest advice to people is like, just go start something. YouTube, I mean, it's impossible, but like just by learning the million different things, it takes thumbnails, description, right? Like, you know them all, you're in it, 
but it, you really have to know it all. So yeah, go start something, figure it out and, and fail. Love to fail. Love that because you're spot on. Because if it goes well, amazing. You just built something completely for yourself. But worst yeah. case scenario, nobody watches. You still have something that, you're, that you love. And two, whenever you go to talk to someone, maybe if it is for a, even a corporate interview, they, they see that you did this. And there's a lot to be said that you continue to do something when it's not being fruitful in, in the conventional yeah. sense. Like when you're not making money and you still grind away, you still post weekly. Like that's, that's incredibly admirable. And employers look at that stuff. And it doesn't matter what field you're in. So I love that if you're listening to this and you want to start a show or you want to start anything, listen to Jack, go start it. And then yeah. see, you'll, you'll be amazed where it takes you or, or where you go internally from it. So I love that so much. Yeah. Jack, and if people go ahead, go ahead. No, I was going to say, and the biggest cheat code to podcast specifically is like, if you save a podcast and you can convince someone to get on, you get 30 minutes with someone you're not normally going to get, which I think is, is the craziest thing I discovered. I didn't even know. So you learn so much through it all, which is just so fun. That, that was the entire reason why I started my show originally. I always think I was a junior in college and I was like, oh, I gotta, I'm gonna graduate next year and I, and I don't like my network enough. Like I wanna know more people. Right. So I started the show and that is the ultimate cheat code. And I always say it like this. If I were to hit Jack up and say, can we talk on the phone for an hour? He'd probably be like, who are you weirdo, go away. But right. because I said, hey, can we hop on the podcast for an hour? Now Jack and I are speaking and now we know each other. So super powerful, love that you said that. So Jack, I wanna thank you so much for your time today. And I'd also love for you to share where people can connect with you and find all your stuff. Yeah, I appreciate it for having me. Like I said, you know, now friend for life that exactly. I hope to, if we can unlock the gates from uh, Canada <laughs> to, to the US soon, hopefully must, we can man. link link in person. But yeah, Jack Settleman on Twitter, Instagram, Snap Exports on, you know, all platforms, Snap Exports spot. Uh, I like when people reach out. Like I think it's fun um, to to just talk with new people, meet new people, find new interests. So definitely don't be a stranger if you have questions or you just want to tell me that the Knicks aren't that good, even though we're <laughs> on an eight game win streak. Whatever, whatever is your cup of tea. Awesome. And so is the best way to get a hold of you through Instagram? Uh, yeah, I would say Instagram, Twitter, really any. I'm pretty responsive on these platforms. You know, that's that's my thesis from day one. It's my yeah. core morals and everything. So yeah, sweet Jack. Thank you so much, everybody listening or watching. Go follow him. Go connect with Jack. And thank you so much for sharing your story, man. I hope to have you on here again soon. Sweet. Thanks, brother.